Hello, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on optical isomerism for AQA. So if you're studying AQA A-level chemistry, then this video is perfect for you. It has everything you need to know for AQA. Um, so it's not like other resources, say, that you might find online, other videos and, and um, documents that you might see that may not be specific. Um, you know, they're just general information, which is fine. Um, but this information you see on here is specific is actually dedicated to AQA so um, you don't have to worry about is this going to be on the spec is it not everything in here is for AQA and likewise I've done a full series of AQA videos for year one and year two on Allery Chemistry YouTube channel um, all I ask is that you hit the subscribe button because they're all for free so I don't charge for them and um, you hit the subscribe button um, that'll be fantastic just to show you support and as long as people keep subscribing uh, and watching the videos then I will keep making them and um, also on that channel I suppose on that on that point there's also some I do have some generic whiteboard videos as well uh, whiteboard tutorials where I go through specific areas of chemistry and also I've got some um, uh, some um, <laughs> some past paper walkthroughs and mine went blank there some past paper walkthrough uh questions where it basically tries to improve the exam technique but it's it's constantly adapting and changing and evolving so uh, you know to keep up to date then press the subscribe button um these uh the video here is actually made from um a powerpoint presentation that i've made as part of a revision series of resources um they're available if in the link so if you click on the link in the description box they're available there um uh, they're good value for money um, there's a full range from year one and year two, um, and you can use them on your smartphone or tablet, um, um, you know, on the move, so you can use them then. And I've known some people actually print off the slides as well and use them as revision notes. Uh, so uh, feel free to, you know, to do that. Click on the link, you'll be able to purchase them from there. Like I say, the great value for money. Okay, so like I say, this is dedicated to AQA, and so therefore it meets the specification points. Um, as you can see on there. So we're mainly looking at optical isomerism. We're going to look at how we actually make um, uh, optically active compounds, so how we how we make them using um, uh, aldehydes, so uh, substances contain the carbonyl group, and we're going to look at racemates and enantiomers. So some funny, strange words in this in this video here. Okay, so what we're going to do is going to look at optical isomers first okay so you can see a picture of my hands there. i'll come into that in a minute um so optical isomerism is a form of stereo isomerism so that means that uh, optical isomers have the same structural formula but a different arrangement of atoms in space okay um so it's intriguing with the hands isn't it i'll come on to this you probably if you've seen if you've done optical isomers you'll probably know where i'm getting at with the hands but um Yes, you'll, you'll see that in a moment. So optical isomers are mirror images of each other and they have a chiral carbon, okay? So that's the a carbon in the middle of a molecule, okay? So what we mean when we say chiral is that the molecule, uh, the atom, sorry, has four different groups attached to it. And we can arrange these groups in two different ways and that forms two different molecules. Um, we call these enantiomers. Okay, so that's very important. There's your first keyword. So basically, um, basically what that means is you've got uh, a carbon atom, and around that carbon atom, you've got four very different groups surrounding it, and that is a chiral molecule. And chiral molecules, um, obviously, um, have uh, mirror images. You have two different versions of that molecule, so they're mirror images, and we call them mirror images and enantiomers. And basically, what that means in an enantiomer is non-superimposable so it you can move it across you know over the top of the another enantiomer and it won't actually fully superimpose and it is a perfect mirror image as well okay so this actually leads us on to what we mean in a in a kind of more tangible way and that is hands hands have a chiral center and they're mirror images of each other as you can see in the picture there um so you can see these are this is a mirror image you can see there's a if you put a mirror line down the middle there um there's a the non-superimposable as you're going to see here so let's have a look so there we are oh it's uh breaking up a little bit so you can see there anyway i think you get the idea when you see it it will run smoothly much more smoothly when you uh when you um if you if you do have a hold of these it's uh it's because it's um i think it's working through this might work smoother there there we are that's better Okay, there we are. Okay, so you can see that when we overlap the hands, uh, I think it's because I'm running software alongside it, so it's obviously slowing it down a little bit. So but you can see when we put the hands above one and one another, they actually don't superimpose 
um, at all. Um, but you can see the mirror images, and we can apply the same principle to molecules. So let's look at it on a molecular level. So these two are enantiomers of each other, and you can see we've got the mirror line down the middle there. So there's the mirror line there. So your mirror line's down there, and you can see these are clearly mirror images of each other. And if I take this one and put it over the top of that one, it doesn't matter how many times I orientate that, it isn't going to superimpose. It's not going to overlap. So that's what we mean. So we need to be able to find a chiral center. Okay, so that's quite that's quite an obvious thing. So we know what a chiral center is, and we know what we're looking for. We're looking for four different groups surrounding a carbon atom. So we need to be able to spot it. So let's have a look and see if we can find a chiral center. So first, um, what we need to do is, uh, when we're finding chiral centers, we need to draw them in a tetrahedral 3D shape um, after we've found the chiral center. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then we draw them as enantiomers, as we've seen there, just on the previous slide. So, first of all, here's our molecule here, and we need to find our carbon atom um, that is the chiral center. We have four different groups that we're looking for around it, so see if you can spot them. So, one group is here. That's the blue circle there. Okay, so that's one. Second one is there. There it is. Okay. Third one is there. And the fourth one is obviously our carboxyl group. So you can see we've got a chiral center that's right in the middle there because surrounding that carbon, as you can see, you've got four different groups surrounding the carbon in the middle. Okay. So then what we need to do, once we've found our chiral center, we then need to draw it as a 3D shape. So a tetrahedral shape because we've got four uh, we've got four groups coming from the carbon. So here, so here it is. There we are. So remember, you would have done this in year one chemistry when you drew 3D representations of molecules. So just as a very, very quick reminder, you always have a wedge coming out. So this is an atom coming towards you. And you have one that's going away, which is this one here. So this is your carboxyl group uh, with a line, a dotted line showing out a, a bond going away from you. And then these ones here, your solid lines, are in your plane of vision. So these are the ones that, if you were to look at it as a 3D model, they would be um they wouldn't be neither coming towards you or going away so they're in your plane of vision so just a reminder of how you draw them 3d 3d molecules so once we've drawn our 3d shape we then need to represent them as an antimers. so you can see we need to draw a mirror line mirror image to show them um to show the two enantiomers so here it is here okay so you can see that this molecule is definitely 3d shape and you can see that it is definitely an enantiomer of each other because the mirror line goes down here and this is a mirror image of this and if you put them over each other they're non-superimposable so the main criteria is looking for these four different groups anything any four different groups around a carbon is definitely chiral and if it's chiral it will have two enantiomers it'll have a mirror image of each other Okay, so how do you actually spot these? Because if you, if you look at these, it's really difficult. They've got the same molecular formula, the same functional groups, and you be thinking, well, how on earth do you actually spot these things? How do you detect them? Well, what we use is we use something called plain polarized light. Okay, And so if we have a chiral center, we say that uh, molecules with a chiral center are optically active. Okay, So what that means is that they will, pro they will rotate plain polarized light um, and effectively, if we have a molecule in there that is chiral and rotates plane pol and and it is chiral, then it is optically active. Then, if we shine light through it, plane polarized light, then it will rotate it. Now, the next thing is, well, what is plane polarized light? Well, I've got this really handy diagram to show you. So, you've got normal light. So, this is standard white light that comes through the window. It's coming through the window right now that I can see. Um, it has um, load. It has lo a variety of different. Um, frequencies in there and um, if we just pick one frequency then they're oscillating in many different directions okay so that's standard light so that is no good we need to um, polarize this light so what we do is we pass it through a polaroid filter and a polaroid filter blocks um, most of the directions or most of the um, orientations of the light and only allows one orientation to go through so you can see here this is now plain polarized light so we have blocked all of the other orientations apart from this blue one which has come through the filter um, and is only oscillating in one direction so then what we do is if we've got our app optically active compound in here so let's say there isn't a chiral center in this in this solution here then what will happen to this plane polarized light is it will rotate and it will rotate um left or right so um very straightforward however what we've got to look at is remember we said there was two enantiomers in our in our um for every um optically active compound we always have two enantiomers now you might have more of one enantiomer than the other 
um, which is fine. It means you'll get an overall oscill oscillation. But basically, how you distinguish between each enantiomer is one of the enantiomers will rotate it. Here's your two enantiomers. So one enantiomer will rotate it clockwise, and the other enantiomer will rotate it anticlockwise. But they'll both rotate it by the same level of degree. So, for example, if this one is rotating by five degrees uh, clockwise, then the other enantiomer will rotate it five degrees anticlockwise. So the degree of um, orientation is the same. It's just um, each enantiomer will rotate the light in opposite directions. So that's very, very important. Um, and it allows us to identify, obviously, if there's a majority of one enantiomer over another, then you'll get an overall rotation of light. Now, the problem comes when actually you've got an equal amount. And when we've got an equal amount of each of these enantiomers, we get something called a racemate. So a racemate is just an equal amount of each enantiomer um, and we have what we call a racemic mixture okay so that's where we have a 50 50 mix of each enantiomer now racemates do not rotate plain polarized light and this is because both enantiomers rotate um obviously you've got equal amount of each enantiomer and they're rotating in opposite directions so the net effect is zero there's no rotation now you've got to be really careful with that because just because you shine light through a plane polar a, a sample and it doesn't rotate plane polarized light it doesn't mean that you don't have optically active compounds in there be really really careful with that in the exam because they will say oh look it doesn't rotate plane polarized light and automatically you might think oh well it doesn't have a chiral center so i just get rid of that out of my mind and look at something else it might have a chiral center it's just you might have a 50 50 mix of each enantiomer and therefore you form an erasmus so you can see a racemic mixture of a chiral product is often made by reacting a chiral substances together okay so if we have something basically um two substances which don't have a chiral center normally when we react them two together we can form a chiral center okay so when the molecules um when the molecules react there's even a chance um of forming of forming each enantiomer as well so we can actually form um you know some one enantiomer and another enantiomer some reactions we only get one uh, we you know, majority we get one type of um enantiomer so let's have a look at an example here so you can see here we've got our um um uh, alkane which is here this is alkane and we're going to react it with a halogen uh, or halide ion should i say which is br minus so that will form this type of compound here and you can see this carbon's got four different groups surrounding it so that's chiral or it can form um it can form this where actually the halogen is actually at the top there so um you can see that neither of these are chiral um, because we've got two hydrogens there, so they're the same, so they're not four different groups. But actually, by reacting it with two non achirals, we can actually form uh, chiral compounds, as you can see here, plus we can form uh, hydrogen bromide. Okay, so we can see that, as like I say, either of the hydrogen atoms can be replaced, and what we do is we produce a mixture of two enantiomers, as you can see on there. And obviously, there's a 50 50 chance of either hydrogen being replaced so the answer so the um isomers are made in equal quantities it doesn't make um well it's not always the case that you always get 50 50 mix and um, sometimes you can get the majority of one enantiomer um and very very little of the other enantiomer so it can be heavily weighted towards one side so um sometimes you just get you know you only produce one enantiomer depending on the reaction um you know but there's always with enantiomers there's always um you know it's a mirror image it always has a mirror image it doesn't mean practically that you are going to produce that okay so you can see here's the diagram here so these are the two molecules that we've just seen before and you can see they're clearly mirror images of each other uh, you've got the mirror line down the middle there uh, and obviously both of them are enantiomers so um, it's really difficult to adapt a reaction to only produce uh, one enantiomer um, it can be expensive and then you might be thinking also well, what why why do you only need one enantiomer what's the point why would you just just let it produce both well you might have heard of a, a case um, years ago called thalidomide where it was um, designed or, or produced to uh, make uh, for, for morning sickness so for people who people who were pregnant and suffering morning sickness then they could take thalidomide um, now one of the enantiomers of that drug was successful at doing that um the other enantiomer actually was dangerous and it caused deformities in children and you get 
um, you know, children, um, obviously this is many years ago, um, you know, they'll be a, a considerably older, you know, considerably older now, uh, because this this happened um, back in the 60s, but, um, you know, these people were born and were um, born with deformities and maybe missing limbs or, um, you know, stunted limbs, etc. So it is really important, especially in pharmaceuticals, that if we are producing a drug, that, um, you know, if we are keeping both anatomies in there, we've got to make sure that obviously the useful one is doing what it needs to do, but, um, you know the 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 one that isn't isn't required does that have any side effects and if it does we've really got to try and remove that enantiomer um, you know if it isn't you know there's loads of it's very common to have uh, you know it doesn't take a lot to have optically active compounds you might find that the other one just doesn't do anything you know so one of them might actually cure the the disease it's trying to cure um, or relieve pain for etc and the other one might do absolutely nothing that has no side effects so there's no point in removing it if it doesn't have any any significant impact. So, um, so it is cost. It's all down to cost. Um, you know, it's all one thing. It's all well and good producing a drug, um, but if it costs hundreds and thousands of pounds to buy, um, you know, then you might think, well, you know, is it is it, um, you know, is it is it viable? You know, um, so you know, drugs cost a lot of money, and and health services, particularly, obviously, if you listen outside of the UK, but particularly in the UK, you've got the NHS, which is the the buyer of these drugs, and they're made by private companies, and so you know there's a cost to every drug, and they've got to try and work out is there a cost benefit analysis, and not all drugs are you know are economically obviously every drug is viable, you know if it's going to help somebody's life or save their life, but um, you know um, there's a cost to everything, and if there isn't any money to buy it, it can be quite difficult, maybe it's to justify if it's only going to maybe cure one or two people's lives, um, you know if the drug is more uh, widely needed um then obviously you know there's a there's a cost there's a cost associated with that so basically we've gone off a bit topic here but you've got um you know you've got to weigh these things up there's a cost and is it worth it to make the drug is there a, you know is there a, is there a benefit of of doing the drug or is there another way of making it so this is why drug development takes years to come up with because you've got to look at tests you've got to trial it you've got to make sure it works and um, racemates form a massive part in drug development um you know in antimers uh, in antimers in that in that case and we've got to make sure that you know um is the enantiomer is it worth taking it out of the drug so so that's what we've got to look at here okay so um Molecules with planar po- profiles such as double bonds in C, C double bonds, and C double bond O can make racemic products. Okay, so this is quite important because we're going to look at a mechanism here. So these reactions occur when we have an attack on the carbonyl group, so C double bond O group, C double bond O group, um, of an unsymmetrical ketones or aldehydes. Okay, so you would have seen this um, before. Um, you might have seen aldehydes and ketones before um in particular making carboxylic acids for example now we're going to look at an example where propanol reacts with acidified potassium cyanide so kcn in this particular example so we have as you can see here unsymmetrical an unsymmetrical ketone okay so we've got uh, this is an aldehyde sorry an unsymmetrical aldehyde so you can see here this bit is um is, is planar okay so this is the planar bit this bit's flat this bit has um bits sticking out everywhere obviously i've drawn it in this way um you know because that's the standard way of drawing it but this bit is the planar bit this bit's flat okay so if we tilt it onto one side we can actually see it we can actually see it drawn out there so as part of the um uh so as the uh, C double bondo that should say part not pat <laughs> I don't know who pat is um, so as the I'll get that changed of course um, so as the carbonyl group the C double bondo part of the molecule is planar this bit the CN minus sign that we're going to um, react this onto can attack from either the above or it can attack from below and this forms two different enantiomers so let's have a look so you can see the CN minus attacking from the top or from the bottom so you can see here that these are um, nucleophiles and um, they have a lone pair of electrons so they're nucleophiles and they're attacking a delta positive carbon in the middle and you can see it's got an equal chance of it reacting at the top or reacting at the bottom um, you know there's a, there's no there's no other groups there that would hinder it one way or the other so the type of enantiomer formed will actually depend on if the cyanide ion attacks from the top or if it attacks from the bottom so you can see here if it attacks from the top or the bottom we get two different enantiomers so we get both enantiomers here as you can see and they're mirror images so we know there's a, a chiral center there chiral carbon 
So due to that planar nature of that carbonyl group, there's an even chance of the nucleophile attacking from the top and from the bottom. So there's no preference, like I say. So what this means um, is that we're likely to produce, obviously, a racemic mixture. Um, so it's a racemate because we're getting 50-50 mix of each enantiomer. And so as with all racemic mixtures, they don't rotate plane polarized light because the rotation cancels out on each of them. Um, so um, that's really, really important that, that, you, that you're aware of that. I can't stress that enough. Just because it says it doesn't rotate plane polarized light doesn't mean it's not, doesn't have a chiral center. As you can see here, it can have a chiral center. It just might be a, a racemate. So just have that in the back of your mind and just make sure you, you, know, you score that off. Okay. And that is it. So that's it on optical isomerism. Um, so quite a short topic, relatively speaking. Um, but you do need to know about obviously a lot of keywords in that one, like racemate, uh, enantiomers, um, you know, your 50-50 mixes, for example. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, you know, terminology that you need to be able to express in the exam. Um, like I say, there's a full range of videos, though, for AQA um, for um, year one and year two chemistry. Um, go and have a look there, as well as for other exam boards as well. Um, that I've done go and have a look it's on Allery Chemistry YouTube channel um, full range of whiteboard tutorials and exam pa exam past paper questions as well so there's loads of stuff on there and it's constantly changing all for free all I ask is you please hit the subscribe button that'll be fantastic um, and also these are available to purchase as well if you just click on the link in the description box great value for money and great um, revision material as well obviously any I'll change that word from pat to part um, you know all that will be updated but you can get them from the test shop all right, that's it. Bye-bye.